the best way to entice readers to read your book and finish your book is by telling stories. But how do you tell stories? What are the best stories to tell? What are the different kinds of stories you could tell? You're going to find out today in today's masterclass with Henry DeVries. I'm Dan Janelle. I'm a book strategist. I've written more than a dozen books that have been translated into six languages. No matter where you are in the book writing process, I can help you as your ghostwriter, book coach, or developmental editor. Now, let's get started. Our special guest today is Henry DeVries, one of my longtime friends, allies, partners, business partners, friends. We go to ball games, we go to sushi, we, we have lots of fun together. He's also a columnist for Forbes.com for several years. So if you or your authors have a business marketing, business sales uh, story possibility, Henry is quite open to talk to them or uh, let them know how they can get into his column. He has very strict uh, requirements and he can send you those requirements by email. But again, if you're in the business sales, marketing, communications space, uh, Henry is all, all open for new stories and new clients to help you guys. Okay. He's also the author of numerous books about marketing and communications, as well as storytelling. He has uh, his latest book is Persuade with a Story and Persuade with a Digital Story. And I understand that you have another book coming out in December on yet another storytelling topic. So Henry is going to share lots of great information with us today on how business writers can tell stories and how nonfiction writers can tell stories properly. So Henry, take it away. Well, thank you for inviting me to talk about storytelling. Um, I'll start with a story. <laughs> so the year is 2015. The place is Memphis, Tennessee. We're in an 800 square foot apartment, just about a mile from the Mississippi Bridge. And Penny Reed, another Penny, Penny Reed, is sitting at her kitchen table and she's looking at a stack of unpaid bills and she has no idea how she's gonna pay these bills. Um, it was a far cry from the 4,000 square foot home she used to share with her husband, now her ex-husband, um, who was also her employer, now her ex-employer, and who gave her all her clients. So Penny had no big home, no employer, no clients. And she's a special woman. I hope you get to meet her one day. Because she said, well, if you're going to dream, let's dream big. In two years, I'm going to be a best-selling author and professional speaker, and I'm going to make $200,000 a year. That's when I met Penny Reed. And I said, Penny, let me ask you, what do you know how to do better than anybody else? She says, oh, I got this. She goes, I know how to help dentists grow their business. And let me tell you, dentists are screwed up people. Dentists borrow money to go to college. Then they go borrow more money to go to graduate school, to become a dentist. Then they borrow money to open an office and a practice. And they think they own a business. The truth is a business owns them. They're the indentured servant to all those loans for the rest of their life or until they can find somebody who will take this business off their hands. They don't have cash flow or time to enjoy life. I know how to give them that. I said, bingo, we've got a model. I said, okay. She goes, so what's the plan, Henry? Are we going to like write this book with a provocative title and then it's going to be out there and I'm going to be invited to speak and people are going to hear me speak and they're going to invite me for more speeches and then paid consulting gigs. And I said, oh, no, that's not the plan. I said, the plan is I want you to start making one phone call a day. She said, who am I going to call? I said, I got this. People who book speakers to talk to dentists and dentists who hire consultants to help them grow their business. She goes, oh, okay. I said, one a day. Meanwhile, we're writing the book. She says, what's the sexy provocative title? I said, oh, I've got it. She says, oh, you do? I said, yeah. Are you ready? She goes, okay. It's growing your dental business. It's what they want and it's what you know how to give them. 
Uh, so we're going to write that book. We wrote that book. She made her phone calls. Uh, she thought when the book came out, she'd ha get to quit making phone calls. I said, no, you have to keep making phone calls and you have to mail one copy of that book out a day. Who would I mail it to? <laughs> People who book speakers to talk to dentists and dentists who might hire a consultant. Um, fast forward to the story. Two years later, Penny's at her computer. She's printing out her profit and loss statement for the year. Boo, 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 boo. Comes off the computer. She looks at it. Gross profit. $200,000 took two years to go from zero to $200,000. Penny Reed lets me tell that story under two conditions. One, that I not make her ex-husband the villain of the story. She said, he's not. We just didn't want to be married anymore. And the second thing is, she said, tell him now it's up to $280,000 a year. Okay, that's a story. That's one of my defining stories. We live in emotional times and we need people to make decisions. Neuroscientists have proven that people make decisions not with the logical part of their brain, but with the emotional part of the brain. So how do we reach the emotional part of the brain? We tell a story. Actually, we tell one of eight stories there are eight stories that human brains are hardwired for. So I'm gonna share with you the eight stories and each of these stories needs three characters. I gave you a clue that in Penny's story, we didn't want her ex-husband to be the villain character, the nemesis character. So that's one of the three. I wish you could have been with me in Los Angeles. The year is 2014. I am in a high rise tower in downtown Los Angeles, and it's the penthouse office of a law firm. The managing director of the law firm had invited me in to talk to a group of CEOs about persuade with a story. And CEOs persuade prospects, they persuade investors, they persuade top job candidates. And I taught them how to use storytelling in that. After I was done with the workshop, the managing director asked me to come back with him to his inner sanctum, his sanctum sanctorium, his inner office. And in his inner office, it was filled with movie posters and movie memorabilia. And I said, oh, well, let's call him Bernie the attorney. I said, Bernie, you're a big movie fan? And Bernie said, well, actually, Henry, my grandfather was one of the most famous producers in Hollywood in the 20s and 30s. And my father became one of the most famous producers in Hollywood in the 40s and 50s. Uh, I chose to go into entertainment law. But I remember grandpa used to always say, you know, we only make eight movies in Hollywood. And I never knew what he meant until your workshop today. And that's because I told him about the eight great stories. Uh, one, overcoming the monster. Two, the Cinderella rags to riches underdog story. Three, the comedy solution to a problem, solving a problem with a wacky idea. Four, the tragic solution to a problem, trying to solve a problem with a idea that is against the laws of nature, the government, the universe, and it always ends badly. They're cautionary tales. Five, the mystery story. Riddles and clues and Sherlock Holmes and Agatha Christie and what does this all mean? Um, I'm gonna do a pattern interrupt here. Um, pattern interrupt is when you interrupt a sequence and, and you get the audience uh, going, oh, we're interrupted. What's he gonna talk about now? I'm gonna talk about that. You might think these are from fiction, and they're from those Hollywood movies and plays and scripts and novels. I've also studied the 100 greatest all-time business books, and they follow the same eight story patterns. Five's that mystery. Six is the quest, the, the search, uh, going for the prize, um, Indiana Jones and uh, going after the Holy Grail or going after the Ark of the Covenant. Seven is the rebirth comeback redemption story 
uh, the Phoenix rising, all's lost, and then being rebuilt from there, uh, people reinventing themselves. Uh, a Christmas carol, um, Scrooge gets redeemed in the night by three ghosts. The eighth is the escape story, where you're in a normal place, you go to a crazy place, you get back to normal. Uh, Alice in Wonderland, Alice falls down the rabbit hole, or Alice in the looking glass goes through the looking glass and goes to Wonderland, which uh, Wonderland is crazy town. Let's just call it what it is. You know, you get big, you get small, you, you, you drink this, you eat that. If Lewis Carroll wasn't on drugs when he wrote that book, I don't know what is true. Then Alice gets back to England. Maybe you'd prefer Dorothy Gale uh, from Kansas, ma'am. Uh, Dorothy Gale and the Wonderful Wizard of Oz is in Kansas and then goes to Oz transported by a tornado and then has to escape Oz and get back to Kansas. It wouldn't be my choice, but okay, that was Dorothy Gale's choice. That's the escape from crazy town. Uh, there, I wrote a book called The Prodigal Executive. I ghost wrote that book um, about how executives get off track and they have to get back on track. Uh, otherwise they'll be lost. Um, one of my authors wrote a book based on my inspiration called Outsmarting Crazy Town. And it's about executives who everything's going great in their career and then everything uh, turns to poop. It's awful. And they want to quit and reinvent themselves. But she is an executive coach who says, actually, you need to get back on track. Where you're at is probably your best opportunity. And she helps people do that. It's a fictional tale about that. So even though a lot of us are in nonfiction, Sometimes we'll use a fictional story, um, either within a book or the whole book might be like The One Minute Manager by Ken Blanchard, which is a fictional story. Um, it's an overcoming a monster problem because you're promoted to be a manager and you don't know how to do it and they're going to fire you. You know, you, you it's the Peter principle. You rose up to your level of incompetence. So in The One Minute Manager, um, the mentor character, that's one of the characters, uh, helps the main character, the hero character, the protagonist, if you will, learn how to be a manager. Um, the Richest Man in Babylon, a uh, classic investment book, is um, what I call a novella, a business novella, where we've invented this story. The Go-Giver by Bob Berg, uh, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. So you can see the patterns here, where sometimes uh, we're telling a story because the human brains are hardwired for those eight stories. Um, so let me give you three techniques to help you. Um, one is to know what story you're telling. Um, this is a, uh, there, there be dragons. This is a dragon, it's a monster. It's to symbolize if you're telling a problem solution story where if they don't solve the problem, everything, you know, it could kill the company, kill the career, kill a person. Um, you're telling an overcoming the monster story. In literature, you would know it as things like Dracula, uh, Beowulf, Jaws. Um, these are all examples of this story. Um, in business, there are books like The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. That's, it's gonna kill the team unless they figure it out. This is Cinderella. So it's Cinderella is the underdog story, the rags to riches, David versus Goliath story. If you're telling about, oh, by the way, I've ruined movies for my family uh, because we'll be watching a movie and it'll be a Disney cartoon about this rat that wants to be a chef. And the father rat says to him, son, I know it's been hard ever since your mother died. We go, oh, orphan, underdog story, rat wins in the third act. Uh, or the cheerleaders walk in and the, you know, there's blonde cheerleaders and they're dressed in pink. And then the cheerleaders all black hair and dressed in black come in and go, oh no, this is not over. We're gonna see you at nationals. My family goes, oh, um, you know, the villain character, showdown, third act, blonde cheerleaders win. So I've ruined movies for it. When you see an orphan, a plucky orphan, oh, by the way, I'm, I'm not a big fan of Cinderella. It was not the book I read to my uh, two daughters who, uh, are uh, in business now and have executive positions. Because basically this story is, if you are an underdog, but you're plucky, 
you work hard and you wear a uh, size two dress and a size zero shoe, you too could be rescued by a handsome prince and live happily ever after. That was not the message I was I was telling my daughters. I was I was uh, quoting Beyonce, uh, independent women. You know, anything you want, you bought it, you got it. Okay. Um, comedy, wacky idea. Um, so think of the movie Wedding crashers. Oh, we're two attorneys. We we uh, don't know how to meet women. We're so busy. Oh, I know. Wacky idea. We'll dress up and on the weekends we'll crash fancy weddings and we'll meet uh, women who are all dressed up looking for love. Uh, this is the plot of wedding crashers. Um, so the, the, the tragic tale, usually we only tell these as cautionary tales, but this is uh, where you try to take a shortcut with an idea. And usually everything's going so well at the start. The Godfather um, is certainly this. Um, older movie, but uh, probably you've heard of it or seen a rerun, um, Scarface, Al Pacino, about an immigrant who comes to America from Cuba and becomes an entrepreneur. He's selling white stuff that makes everybody happy. Um, but uh, it all ends, you know, say, you know, at the end with a hail of bullets. Um, these are cautionary tales that we tell. The mystery is if it's a riddle, a clue, unlocking a secret, cracking the code. Um, my first bestseller was Self-Marketing Secrets. It was a mystery. Uh, my most recent book, Rainmaker Confidential, is a mystery. I'm taking the mystery out of making it rain, finding clients. So I'm a big fan of the mystery. It shows up a lot in my writing uh, that I'm helping people um, crack the code and break it. So if your story is about something that's a mystery that you're revealing, you're doing that. The quest story, the quest is you're after a prize. Um, in business literature, how to win friends and influence people. The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. Um, my book, How to Close a Deal Like Warren Buffett. So that's a quest. It's a prize. It's a journey. Interestingly, quest stories are usually about the main character goes after a prize, but then learns information and insights along the way that are more valuable than the prize they were seeking. So little, little uh, insider secret there. Like, uh, I think, I don't know, did Dan mention I love baseball, that we go to baseball games together? Sure he did. Um, so I'm a baseball nut. So I kind of take the inside baseball approach to explaining stories. Okay, um, seven is that comeback, redemption, rebirth, um, you know, in the Bible, you know, it is uh, Saul on the road to Damascus becomes the Apostle Paul. Um, I mentioned Christmas Carol where Scrooge gets redeemed. Um, anytime it's about uh, where it was over and then people had to reinvent, rebuild. Um, I, I mentioned that human brains are hardwired for these stories, by the way. They don't show up just on accident. It's because psychologists like uh, Freud and Jung would say we're hardwired that we need to hear these stories. Uh, it's one of the reasons I tell authors that their stories are their hidden assets. Nobody else can have their stories and people need to hear their stories because we, we need to hear about the reinvention, the comeback, because we all get knocked down in life and all have to make a comeback. So these stories are life affirming. The number eight is that escape story. Uh, I mentioned Wonderland, I mentioned Oz, and I mentioned business examples where first it's normal, it goes to crazy, and then it goes back to normal. Uh, so that escape story is, is very prevalent. So those are the eight stories. Why is it important to know what story you're telling? Because you need to give the listener, the reader, the clues in this, um, because we know what comeback stories are. We know what underdog stories are. Um, I don't know if you know the term underdog. It, it came from uh, dog fighting, you know, something illegal now. Thank goodness it is. But 
if you were the top dog, you were the dog that was usually the strongest, won the most, came out. And the underdog was usually the, the, the dog that got pinned and had to escape. And there's just this natural human reaction to root for the underdog. Um, so in these stories that you tell, when I told the Penny Reed story, and I wanted you to root for Penny. Uh, Penny's is a rebirth story. You, she had a great house and a great job and a great life. You, you sense that. And now she's at an 800 square foot apartment at a kitchen table with a stack of bills. She has no idea how she's going to pay these bills. She's the victim of undeserved misfortune. You rooted for her. I have another story where I get people to root for a man who's a multimillionaire. Um, and in the first minute of that story, you're rooting for that person. So why is that? Well, there are certain tricks and techniques you do. Also, the story that you choose to tell dictates that. Um, if they're doing something brave, going after that monster problem, we're going to root for them. If if they're if the quest is a worthy quest, uh, they're called to a worthy quest. We're going to root for them on that quest. So that's important. Knowing what story you're telling, you can drop the clues to the listener and to the reader so that they can be involved. There is a ninth story. There is a ninth story. It's the grandpa story. Well, we were taking the hogs up to Cumminsville. They had the fair there. You know, I always like to stop for some uh, blueberry pie. It's not as good as your Aunt Marge's strawberry rhubarb pie. You know, Marge married a drunk. He gets drunk every Saturday night at the Moose Lodge, and, and they run the trash collection business. And you're thinking, where is this story going? What is this story about? Um, I don't want you telling that story. This is sort of the rambling story. You can gain trustworthiness in two minutes or less by telling the right story, a story about how you helped the main character go from mess to success. And that tells us what character you are. So this is the second secret. So, you know, my, my, my premise here is anybody by learning a few of these techniques can be a better storyteller. That's my premise. So one technique, let's learn the eight stories. Second technique, Let's learn the three main characters. Every story has three main characters. I'll use the Star Wars characters to illustrate. Uh, the main character, this is Luke Skywalker. If you're, a, a, that's 40 years ago. If you want a more modern reference, uh, the Star Wars movie where Rey is the main character. If you notice, she dresses the same way. Her lightsaber is the same color. We're given lots of clues here that this is the same type of character. The main character, um, by the way, he's an orphan, right? He's living with his aunt and uncle on a, on a water farm on a desert planet. So when we meet Luke Skywalker, we're going to know that the main story here is an underdog story. And this is the underdog we're talking about we meet feature. So we need a second character. We need a nemesis. This is... Uh, Darth Vader. By the way, spoiler alert, uh, if you don't speak Dutch like I do, uh, Darth uh, Vader, v Vader, father, <laughs> father Dutch. He's Luke's father. <laughs> so that'll be revealed in the second movie. Okay, so this is the opposing force uh, that is stopping our main character or trying to stop our main character. It's a challenge. Without challenge in the story, it's boring. It doesn't have to be as clear cut as these good and bad um, iconic characters I'm showing you. Uh, sometimes I teach people that the nemesis could be um, the pandemic of 2020, the recession of 2008, um, Obamacare. I love that. In one of my workshops, somebody said, you know, I don't like that Obamacare. I prefer the uh, Affordable Health Care Act. I didn't have the heart to break it to him. Those are the same things. That's just different names for the same things. But I'm glad you liked one of them. Uh, but it can be these things, uh, government regulations. It doesn't have to be a person or personified by a person. Um, it can just be a condition that they're opposing. But there's a third character. Oh, why as you think I am? Um, this is the mentor character. In Star Wars, it's uh, filled by a couple of people. One, Obi-Wan Kenobi, but he was the apprentice of 
this Jedi master, uh, Yoda. And Yoda is the voice of wisdom and experience. Um, what, 900? But not grammar. Uh, as good as you look when 900 years old you be. Uh, that's how Yoda speaks. But you kind of you pull it out of him that uh, there's great wisdom there. This is the story. It's always a main character, an opposing force, a nemesis, and then a mentor. And the hero succeeds by following the advice of the mentor. This is important because when you're telling stories that you want to attract more prospects, I want you to tell stories about a prospect who had a problem and you came along, gave them advice, and because of your advice, they got to the solution. They won because they followed your advice. Those are the best prospect attracting stories you can tell. You, a lot of people make this mistake. They make the prospect in the story the damsel in distress. And they come along to save the damsel. That's not very persuasive because nobody likes to see themselves as the victim, the damsel in distress. Um, they like to get credit because you're telling these stories and people relate to them and they go, you know, I'm a lot like Penny Reed. You know, I, 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 you know, I had to come from nothing and had come back and all this. So you're rooting, you project yourself into the story. And it's great that you're seen when I told the Penny story. And that's when I met Penny Reed. So enter the mentor part of the story as you come in when the hero is ready for change. And there's a little more, I left it out in the story, but another good part of that storytelling is when the mentor gives the ideas to the hero, the hero doesn't just accept them. In fact, they push back. Um, sometimes uh, the hero resists or even runs away for a time and has to come back to it. That's what makes the story interesting. So what I left out of the Penny Reed story, and I'll put it in now, when I told Penny she needed to call one person a day, she said, I'll run out of people to call in a week. And I said, no, you won't. There's a million of them and they're multiplying like rabbits. We're just gonna get a list and you're gonna go through the list. Oh, I don't know if I could do that. Yes, you can. And I'm here to train you. I've got scripts, I'll help you. So that's the mentor's role in the story is to tell the main character, you can do it. It's not gonna be easy. You're gonna have to make changes, but if you follow my guidelines, you will win. So the third secret on the storytelling that I like to build in is have a moral to the story, like an Aesop fable. Um, he was a Greek slave from thousands of years ago who invented stories like the tortoise and the hare, the, the race between uh, the rabbit and the turtle. And the rabbit thinks the, the race is in the bag, so he takes a nap. Meanwhile, the turtle just keeps plodding along and in the end wins. And the message of that story is, I'm just letting you all think about it in your mind right now. Slow and steady wins the race. Persistence above all else is what wins. So that's something that sticks with us. When you're telling stories, either in print or orally, um, don't leave it to the audience to come up with the meaning of the story. Tell it to them at the end. Um, so in the Penny Reed story, I could say the same thing about slow and steady wins the race. It wasn't some great overnight transformation. She kept making the phone call a day. She kept plugging on the book. Uh, she kept getting the speaking engagements. She kept getting the consulting engagements. And then in two years, she had reached this big goal she had set for herself. That's another part of the story is uh, I gave you Penny's visible finish line. I created something in your mind that, oh, when she got that penny won. I have another story about a man who almost went bankrupt, but what he really wanted to do was buy a 55,000 square foot building for his business. When the story unfolds at the end, he was able to buy the 55,000 square foot building. Uh, 
What got him there was the wisdom of the team. He was in a CEO peer-to-peer group. They formed a tiger team to help him and they showed him how to attack revenue and how to attack expenses and profitability climbed and he actually got his 55,000 square foot building. Um, So, you know, peer groups work. That's the message of that story. So have a message to your story uh, and share it and impart it. It could be the moral of the story. It could be the message. When I speak to CEOs, often I say, what are the core values of your business? And that might be integrity or generosity or uh, honesty or their core values. And I say, well, define the core value. Now, tell me a story of that core value in action. Actually, I have a writing assignment right now. A company has six core values, but they have 31 fundamentals that go into those core values. And I'm writing a story on all 31 fundamentals, a story that actually happened within the company. Because they know those stories are an asset that as they tell them to job candidates, as they tell them in training, as they reinforce them through staff meetings, people will remember the stories and the stories will reinforce reinforce the culture built around their core values. So that's how all this works. Now, uh, did I always know this? No, I struggled with this before I learned this. Uh, I struggled to get clients and I had mentors who helped me. Uh, One being uh, Christopher Booker. Christopher Booker wrote this book, The Seven Basic Plots. I didn't buy this book. I didn't have any money at the time. I went to a library and found it. Uh, it's, it's over a thousand pages. It's not really a book. It's a weapon. You can buy this and have it in your nightstand and kill burglars who come in. You know, it's that thick of a book. People don't read that. Um, you know, I've turned them into books this size um, and always credit Booker with the seven basic plots. Uh, The eighth plot, he said, was invented 150 years ago by Edgar Allan Poe, and that's the mystery plot. He calls them plots. Um, I I really think they're beyond plots. They're these major stories uh, that happen. And each one has a different feel to it, so knowing the feel uh, really helps you. But I didn't know all this, so I struggled to tell stories, and I struggled. um, And then as I learned this, my speeches improved, my articles improved, um, and people found me as a ghostwriter. Uh, I say found uh, quite literally. Um, I never went out and saying, I'd like to be your ghostwriter to anyone. Um, but I gave seminars on how to obtain clients. And point 15 was write a book. And one client said, um, you say write a book, you've written books, I don't know how to write books, how much would you charge to write a book? So I PFA'd, I pulled from air a number and gave it to him, it was too low. Uh, But I charged him that and his book became, you're not the person I hired. It was a mystery. It was solving the mystery of why 56% of executives who are hired and found through top recruiters, people they pay 30 to $50,000 to search for these executives, why more than half of them failed to meet expectations in the first 18 months. So that was a mystery. That was a quote from one of the interviews for the book that the person said, oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. They get here and we go, you're not the person we hired. Um, I'll I'll give you the uh, plot spoiler. It's because The people who hire these top executives do not detail the expectations of success before they arrive. In my language, they don't say what the visible finish line will be, usually until after they're hired. One instance was the the, uh, CEO was recruited, top, top person, top schools, top everything. And the board reveals when he arrives that they want him to open up Asia as a market. He's never been to Asia. He's never opened up Asia as a market, doesn't have any clue on this. Um, So top people, one out of two, make it. You know, it's like being thrown in the deep end of the pool. 
some swim, some sink. So that's what that book was about. Went to uh, 10,000 copies right away. Uh, they have credit, credited me with, in the last decade, helping them make over a million more dollars than they would have because of this book and the stories that are in it. Now, have you ever failed to persuade somebody to become a client uh, because, well, for whatever reason? I had a mentor who this happened to. Um, he was a business coach. This woman business owner had met with him, but decided to pass on hiring him. They met again seven years later at a party and she admitted she'd made a mistake and that the last seven years had been very rough on her and her business. Now, whose fault really was it? My mentor knew it was his fault, not hers. He failed to be persuasive enough to get her to make the right decision. So I want you to be able to use these stories so you can be persuasive enough to help people make the right decision. So I'm gonna leave you with a couple of challenges. Um, one is if you'd like your work to be highlighted, uh, do what Dan said, send me an email at henry at indiebooksintl.com and all you have to do is put Forbes in the subject line, that's it. I will send you an invitation to pitch me and also detailed instructions on how to make it work. Uh, I'm very clear in my expectations. So that's my gift to you. I write five a month. So I'm like the city bus. There's always another one coming along. So you don't have to do this today, uh, but the sooner you do it, the sooner you could be quoted as an authority in Forbes.com. Uh, the second challenge I want to leave you with is if you'd like a, a free copy of my book, Persuade with a Story. Oh, Dan, this is where they think I'm going to uh, pitch my books. And uh, when I do that, I usually say, if you buy a copy of my book, I'm happy to sign it for you. If you buy two, I'll come to your house and read it to you. This actually is just a free offer. If you send me an email and it says storybook, I will send you a digital copy of this book uh, absolutely free. And in it, it talks about everything we've been talking about today. I also challenge you to go to my website, persuadewithastory.com. There's free downloads, uh, there's videos, there's other instructions on storytelling and how you can reach the emotional decision-making part of people's brains by telling better stories. Well. Dan, with that, I see we're 40 after the hour. Um, I'd like to open it up to uh, any questions or if you want more stories, tell me that, Dan, and I'll give up more stories. Well, thank you, Henry. This was fantastic. Let's open the floor to questions. I know Penny uh, told me that she had some questions and everyone else can raise their hand and I'll know that I'll recognize you in sequence as well. But let's start with Penny. Penny, please unmute yourself and ask, ask your question or questions. Uh, that was great, Henry. Thank you very much indeed. My question is, I want to use a story to open the introduction to my book. Yes. My book is, um, how do we put it, not exactly everybody's favourite subject matter. I write operations manuals uh, for franchises and licences. And the book is about how to create an operations manual to help your franchisees succeed. So I want to start with something that's very, um, very punchy and personal. And I think it's more the escape story. Okay. Would you think that this is a good way to open a book? Or would you think that it's better to have a case History. I've got um, I've got three case histories in the book on how I um, I help companies do what um, do what I do. Okay. So Penny, um, the first answer is yes. I think that's an excellent way to start it. And two, to your next point, yes, it should be succinct. We can't open with a long story. We're not. We're going to lose them. Um, yep. I think. At a minimum, I would say 12 sentences 
that would be the tightest story I think you could write on this. And I'll give you the six beats. It will workshop this. I'll give you the six beats uh, on that story. And then I would also encourage you to consider those case histories, just turning them into case history stories. And I've done that for many companies. So let's go with the six beats, shall we? Uh, and this pertains to everybody. Okay, one, we open with before and the main character's name is mentioned in the first sentence. Um, on this first beat, we also want to make the main character likable. So it's like a Mad Lib. Um, uh, Mad Lib being that game where you filled in the blanks on things. Okay, so the fill in the blank was, um, um, I'll never forget the time I met blank, the name, who was a blank. So in your escape story, Penny, I don't know if you want to role play real quick, but do you have a person in mind? <coughs> I did have a story about how I changed from being a Middle East correspondent because of an incident to writing manuals. It okay, was so this is an autobiographical thing. story. Yeah. Um, okay, it, which can be used. So um, a nice way to introduce that is what was the year? 19, 1983. And what was the place? Beirut airport. The year was 1983 and the place was the Beirut airport. Um, if I remember Beirut in 1983, that was kind of a dicey place to be. Um, Very because the American embassy had just undergone a bomb attack and about 150 people were killed. Okay, that's, in, the, that's in those first two sentences. Yep. And then what was your job at the time? I was a journalist, socioeconomic correspondent, and I was transiting from a swing around the Gulf interviewing ministers and um, um, heads of industry. I was a journalist covering economic issues and uh, had been touring the, the Mideast. Okay, that's beat one. That's before. Okay. Right. If you want to tell us how old you were at the time, you could do that too. Uh, two, something happened. What happened? The story, there's something that makes the story happen. So what, what's going on at this time that triggers things? The PLO were um, shooting down aircraft and the ceasefire arranged hadn't worked. And okay, that was B2. The aircraft. Okay. Now three, um, we, we, and we have the nemesis character, by the way, PLO shooting down aircraft. Um, we, we now got a main character and a nemesis, three. Is there, did you get advice from anybody? Did you talk to anybody about this? What, um, for you to take no, the next but, step? No, but the, 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 the uh, third character, if you like, in the story was the immigration official whom I had met on the way through Beirut to the Gulf States, who wanted to make sure that he saw me when I came back. And I was late, so he gave me a really hard time and kept on saying, are you frightened? Um, we're going to close the airport, you'll never get out. Okay, I'm gonna stop you just for time to move this along. Um, do you recall the person's name? It's not important if you don't. It's probably Mohammed. Oh, okay. So I met with Mohammed and who is he an immigration official for? Lebanon? Or yes, uh, yes, the, the airport. Okay, so that's when I, you know, that's when I met up with Mohammed, uh, an immigration official from Lebanon who had uh, helped me previous. 
quote, you're never going to get out of here, Penny, said Muhammad. So we put dialogue in the story, just like a movie. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll just, in the interest of time, give you the next beats. Um, you were told to do something that wasn't going to be easy, so you, uh, you pursued it in point four. In point five, our nickname for that is you landed the plane. So you succeeded. You did. We don't need a lot of details, but somehow you succeeded. I think we're trying to get you out of there. And yep. then six is the after world and the moral of the story um, of this. So in 12 to 18 sentences, you can have a very compelling story right there. It's, it's like a synopsis of this. It's a movie, Penny. You know, it's Escape from Beirut. Um, did you say this was Escape? Yes. Story? Yeah, yeah. Yep. So, yep. so the normal, normal was you were a journalist in the Mideast and you could make your way around. And then Crazy Town was the attacks and all this. And you needed to get out of there to continue to be a journalist. And eventually, did you return to the Mideast? Oh, yes, many times after that. So that's part of Beat Six. So it did put many me times off. I returned to the Mideast and, um, you know, continued as a journalist. Um, and I don't know if we hearken back to, you know, Muhammad's advice or anything like that. But that's a compelling story. That opens that book. Sounds interesting to me. Great. Henry, thank you so much for that. I really appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, any other, any other, what was the name of the smaller book about story? I'd like to buy it. Uh, Pia, I'd like to send it to you. Um, it's Persuade with a Story, How to Attract Clients and Customers with Heroic Storytelling. Pia, just uh, send me an email and I will send you some electrons you can open uh, up in Vancouver. Very generous of you. Thank you, Henry. She was I worked in Canada. Book, by the way, you just lost uh, nine dollars on the deal. <laughs> I know, I know. Gosh, one of my clients said, "Henry, if you're trying to get into my pocket, you're doing a horrible job." <laughs> Great. Who else has a question for Henry? Please raise your hand or unmute yourself. Oh, I have a question. Uh, let's take yeah. Penny's story again. Let's say that she's writing a book about uh, why your company needs an operations manual and why you should hire me. I would also suggest that she has a story that says something about where she worked with a client that had a problem where they hired her and she wrote this manual and all things were gravy. What kind of bullet, or you call them beats, what kind of beats would you put into a story like that? Because that's really the classic kind of story why someone would hire me. I and mean, you told the story beautifully about the ghostwriting story. If you're listening to this, rewind the tape, See how Henry told the story about how he got hired as a ghostwriter, and you'll see the structure behind the story. It's, it, it was very clear to me. Thank you. Now that I know the inside baseball tricks here, so how would you tell the client story? Um, the client story I would tell in a first beat was, um, you know, uh, Peggy ran a company, and she was likable. You know, a great team builder and all that. Um, and then the second beat is something happened, but then she realized she was lacking an operations manual uh, that could really help her accomplish her goals. Um, that's when I met Peggy. And then, um, then there's dialogue between Peggy and you, I'm gonna say Penny. So Peggy and Penny have dialogue here. And um, Peggy doesn't think that it's possible to do an operations manual, maybe in, in a certain length of time. Um, and then Penny gives pushback and says, yes, yes, you can, but you're going to have to do things differently here. I don't know if we can. You can, and I'm here to help. So four is challenges. Five is the operation manual is finished. Six, the company succeeds greatly in the after picture because of this operations manual. I have a, I have a version of that. Um, so I have to tell it not autobiographical, but um, uh, so I'll try real quick. So um, Mark 
ran a, a, a startup software technology company and they created a software that could revolutionize the, the industry. Um, however, Mark, who was great at code, had no ability to write down an operations manual to uh, explain it. So that's when I was called in. Um, the, the autobiographical part was, uh, it was the first year we were married and I, I miscalculated our taxes. Um, and I was short $900 and I owed the IRS $900 on April 15th. Um, Pia, that would be April 1st for you. Um, tax day in Canada, by the way, April 1st. So on April 15th, uh, I had this money and I look back now, $900, I kind of laugh, but it was everything was hanging on this $900. Um, so, but, so Mark says to me, he goes, um, can you write an operations manual for our software? And I said, yes, I can. And he said, how much would that cost? I said, $900 and it needs to be completed by April 14th. <laughs> So anyway, the operations manual story you're telling is that there's a there has to be a challenge. It can't be. Could you write an operations manual? Yeah, I can do that. Um, on my story, I was putting in there. We call it the ticking clock. That I had to have this completed and paid for on April 14th, so I could write a check to the IRS. Um, subsequently, being a business owner, I found everything's negotiable with the IRS. <laughs> they just want to know that you're in compliance, uh, but. I had a client come to me and he was just distraught because um, he had misdone his taxes and he owed $36,000. And I said, I'm sad to know, but I know what you need to do on this. I'm sad to tell you, but uh, here, you're going to call the IRS. You're going to tell them what happened. Uh, they're going to give you a payment plan. The interest rate is going to be lower than what the bank will charge you. If you can pay it off in 120 days, you know, advantages. And if not, they'll give you up to five years to pay. And then he called me back and he said, everything happened just the way you said. I said, yeah, the moral of the story is more than money, the IRS wants compliance. They don't want somebody on out of compliance list. They want, oh yes, we have a deal with them. They're paying us off. Um, we're getting interest. That's, that's all that matters to them. So in that story, I was just giving clues that um, sometimes the nemesis character at the end it's not really a nemesis when you discover this new knowledge that you can, you know. Um, I really like books and movies where the nemesis is not just pure evil. Um, for instance, I don't know if you are fans of comic books, but the X-Men, there's um, Professor Xavier uh, and the nemesis is uh, this character called Magneto. And you find out they used to be best friends and they both want the same thing, just they have a different idea how it should be pursued. You know, one is that we go and create evolution and the other one is we need a revolution right now. It's just, they have a different ethical perspective on how to do it. That's interesting storytelling um, as opposed to, you know, making what everything the villain is just pure evil. I digress. Dan, another question? Yeah, I have a question for you. More on the marketing side and the client side of storytelling. I had a very wonderful new business prospecting meeting with a doctor last week who wanted to write a book. Uh, and I thought he was hot to trot. He asked for a, uh, an agreement. He wanted to write the book. It was something he put off for many years, something he was really wanted to do. And he, he said that we're a perfect fit. And I was, you know, spending the money already. Okay. Um, so I sent him the contract and I didn't hear from him. And a couple of days later, I got an email that basically said, I don't think that I have enough stories to tell. This is a guy, mind you, who went to Yale and Harvard and has been a doctor for 25 years. And he had this imposter syndrome of saying, I don't have stories. To, I don't think I have stories to tell. What would you do if you were me? to get him back on board. Yeah. Um, so without going into a lot of the sales strategy, I'll just go into the storytelling um, to say 
we need to, storytelling is a team sport. There's the phrase. Storytelling is a team sport and you and I need to be a team. You have hidden stories, hidden assets, if you will, that no one else has, but they need to be mined. My part of being on the team is I'm the miner. I'm going to mine the ore of your story. So I'm going to ask you questions and a series of questions, and I'm going to bring them out of you. Um, and when I do it with people, I usually say, well, let's start with your greatest successes. Tell me about your success. And if it was me, I'd go back and go, oh, Penny Reed was a great success. Well, why was she a great success? I, I took her from zero to $200,000 a year. Oh, well, how did you do that? And then it backs up. So um, like Merlin, the character who grew younger, your stories, uh, mining them goes backwards. You start with not the person and the problem. You start with the great success. And then what happened before that? What happened before that? What happened before that? And then when did you get the mentor character? Like I did with Penny. Um, she didn't know she had a mentor character in that story. When we started to mine it together, oh, well, there's Muhammad, this immigration official told me this or that. Um, oh, great. Um, matter of fact, I liked it better that he was Mohammed and not Reginald from the British uh, consulate. <laughs> you know, it, it made the story more interesting. Um, and then you get to the problem and then you get to the person. And what I usually have to, when I'm mining is get people not to say, well, uh, Chevron Oil wanted this and then Chevron Oil called us. And I go like, Chevron Oil did not call you. <laughs> Somebody, you know, Mike, at Chevron Oil called you. People like to hear about people. So we mine it all the way back to a person. I don't remember the person's name. Um, I'll try to do this quick. Um, I was mining with these financial planners and I said, well, tell me a story about a great success. Well, this portfolio walked into our office one day and when we looked at the portfolio, it was totally upside down. And uh, the previous financial advisor had, uh, put the whole portfolio into stocks. And then in 2008, uh, when the market lost half its value, the portfolio lost half. I said, I gotta stop you here. <laughs> I said, does this portfolio have a name? <laughs> oh, I'm sure it did, but we don't remember her name. I said, oh, it was a her, at least you remember the gender. I said, we'll just call that portfolio Mary. Mary had a problem. Mary did this, uh, you helped Mary. Um, at the end of the story, um, this, this woman was, had sold her pharmacy, but when her money got cut in half, she had to go work part-time at Costco at the pharmacy to make ends meet. And at the, uh, at the end, when they had repaired everything and she's making all this money again, they said, you know, funny thing is she didn't, she didn't quit working at Costco. I said, why? You know, she said, Life was better that she got to spend it every day with some people and helping other people. I said, that's the end of the story. That's the aftermath. She's sleeping at night because of her investment, but her life's better because she gets to be with people and help people. The end. Super. Thank you so much, Henry, for your valuable tips. I learned a lot. I'm sure everyone else did as well. And thanks for your generous offer, too. That's very, very kind of